dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John Institute. Bruce Lee once famously quipped that in order to win in martial arts, you had to be like water, willing to find any crack, any way, and being irresistible in your motion forward. I think we see the same thing in the life of St. Peter, and I think we see the same thing in the life of every successful business leader. I'd like to look at how this applies at our spirituality today. Well, good morning, everybody. We've got such an exciting theme here, looking at the life of St. Peter as an inspiration and a model for us as a leader. And this is something we don't usually think about, right? We usually don't imagine St. Peter as a leader because most of the time, priests have done a bad job of presenting his life to us. Just honestly, I'm thinking about my own life. How many times I've heard the story of St. Peter and all you ever hear is, oh, Peter, he's just like the rest of us. He's kind of a bumbling idiot. And I'm like, you know, that's true, I guess, from a certain perspective, if you want to look at it that way. But there's a lot more to St. Peter than his faults and failings and a lot more to St. Peter than the, you know, the fact that he spoke too soon or, you know, he tried really hard. He was earnest while, but he failed. Peter succeeded a lot more than he failed. What you see in the gospel and the reason why the gospels focus in so much on St. Peter is because he is the leader of the church who was given by God to this earth in order to save the world. I mean, the the church's mission is no small potatoes. The church's mission is nothing to to smirk at. The church's mission is the, the, the very same mission as Jesus Christ. And so as he was serious about his purpose on this earth. So he was serious about the church and he's not going to entrust the church just to some bumbling nincompoop. I hate to tell you, he's going to entrust the church to a man whom he formed for that leadership. So the, and so all of the gospel stories in the three years that you have decrypted here, the life of Christ where Peter is there and therefore, you know, the different mistakes he might make or the different anecdotes that are present. These all in the end, refer to the formation of this incredible leader. And then in the Acts of the Apostle, you have the story of his leadership. And so we got to be just very careful to understand how important Peter's role was and how successfully he did it so that we can then see for our own lives a pattern for how we too can be Christian leaders and what Christ is asking for from us in the ministries that we lead or in the businesses that we lead or in the professions that we undertake for his name. So I'd like to start, we need to start with a prayer and let's just ask the Holy Spirit here to enter this room and to be with us as we start this meditation. In the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, O Holy Spirit, Father of the poor, illumine the hearts of thy faithful and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us in the same spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Peter. Pray for us. St. John, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, we've seen already in Acts, like we've taken a look, we saw how Peter's bold, we see how Peter has to take initiative with Matthias, how he's bold in his proclamation. 
we see that Peter then has to govern over the church in her growth. This is Acts uh, 2, verses 42 to 48. And now all of a sudden we're in Acts 3. Acts 3 is where Peter's life takes a sudden turn and where his leadership explodes in a new way. And I, I want to point this out to you just in the context of it, because if you can see that context, you can really appreciate what this was like. Remember, if you are St. Peter, you do not know what's coming next. All right? So, so many times, like, you know, when you read the stories of great leaders, they're writing in the past tense. I remember one time talking with a billionaire, and I, I was at uh, a, a seminar for that this billionaire uh, started a nonprofit to help, you know, small businesses in America. And I went in order to learn and went through this, you know, course. And then afterwards, you got to meet the billionaire. And during the course, they had told us all about, oh my gosh, this billionaire's business is amazing. And what makes his business so great is his mission statement. His mission statement, his vision statement. These have won awards. Remember them making this big, and all of us are like feeling very small because we're like, gosh, our, <laughs> we're not quite sure what our mission statements ought to be. You know, we're kind of throwing them out there. And they were like, you know, the, the, the nonprofit was trying to help us with this, but they were, you know, kind of singing the praises of this billionaire's uh, 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 mission statement. And so at the end, we got to meet the billionaire and he sat down with us for an hour just to kind of like, you know, chat with us and share with us about his journey. And <laughs> one of the, the people in the class said, tell us how long did it take you to write that mission statement? And the billionaire looked at us and he said, oh, I suppose it took about eight years. <laughs> and we all just like that. The sigh of relief was just palpable, right? We were like eight years. You know, so our businesses haven't even been going for eight years yet, you know, and, and, and it, it was such a relief that he put us in because we think that we have to be perfect to some sort of degree of all those who have succeeded. And we know that, you know, that, that one, term, one time a person told me, you know, every body frozen on top of Mount Everest was at one point a highly motivated individual. <laughs> you know, you're like, well, that's really encouraging. You know, thank you so much. Why don't you give me a nice paper cut and pour lemon juice on it? You know, <laughs> people, the, the people who aren't trying to do anything love to sit on the fence and then just like, you know, make comments to try to discourage the people that are out there actually trying to win the game. So if you're on the field, you got to be ready that the majority of people at a baseball game are not on the field. The vast majority of the people in your life are not trying to do what you're trying to do. And they will sit there and think that they're being helpful or quick. They're just trying to join the game. I mean, you know, they're trying to be a part of this somehow. But what they end up doing is making statements like that. You know, you know every dead body on top of Mount Everest was one time a highly motivated individual. You're like, well, what does that mean? You know, they're like, well, that means that you probably aren't going to make it, you know. Broadway, every light on Broadway is for a broken heart. You know, oh, not every salmon makes it upstream. And they just keep quoting all this stuff to you. And you're looking around going like, doesn't anyone believe in me? And the answer is maybe they don't. You know, they didn't believe in a lot of the great men and women who have shaped the course of history. They, their stories are littered with exactly that same type of attitude. The entrepreneur is driven by an inner fire that no one else can explain and no one can replace. It's an inner fire that comes from Christ and from God who's made you in his image and likeness. He who created the world out of nothing <laughs> and then gives certain souls to this world who see what no one else can see because they see what does not yet exist. And their vocation, your vocation, is to bring into this world what does not yet exist, to make happen what has not existed hitherto. And, and if you embrace that challenge, you've got to embrace that the vast majority of the world is blind to the vision that you have inside. But God sees you. And in his sight, you push forward. And we make something great by daring great things for him. Father Nathan is producing an ongoing source of videos to form, unite, and inspire you and your family. Go to eagleeyeministries.org, that's E-A-G-L-E-E-Y-E ministries.org, and subscribe to Eagle Eye Pro. 
Subscribe today. One of the hardest things about being an entrepreneur and having this vision inside, right? This, I'm going to make something happen where nothing has happened before. And I can see what nobody else sees. I, I can see what doesn't exist yet, right? You know, one of the things that, that, that happens there is that we don't have the luxury of looking back and saying that we, we knew that we would be successful the whole way. Either did St. Peter. Just like that billionaire who won all kinds of awards and made it to be a billionaire because of his mission statement, etc. But for whom it took eight years of not having a mission statement before he drafted his mission statement. He had eight years of bad mission statements. You know, and, and, and now he's like, oh my gosh, everyone, that, that mission statement is the greatest thing ever. You know, and that's why he was so successful, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, tell that to him when he was struggling. Tell that to him when he was all by himself. You know, someone sent me a, a picture of, the, the, of Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos, you know, the founder of Amazon. You know, they sent me a picture and it's of him all by himself in a, a rented workspace at a desk with a computer, no staff, no help, no office. He's just at like, at like this, you know, share space type of thing. Uh, and Amazon.com is spray painted on a piece of paper behind him, like he spray painted it himself just to make some sort of like, because they probably didn't have a printer that was big enough to make some sort of nice sign. He didn't want to invest in it. So he just spray painted it. And it's at the very beginning days of Amazon, which is now, of course, taking over the world. And you're like, at that time, did he know that this was what he was supposed to do, what he needed to do, that he would be successful? Heck no, he didn't. He had a drive in him like water. Now, Bruce Lee said that a fighter, to fight, you have to become like water. You have to be looking. No matter, we don't know what's going to happen, but you know that you're going to adapt to what's happened, move forward like water, through cracks, through crevices, be bounced around, but you do not stop moving, moving, moving. And that adaptability of being able to flux and to flow actually is why you succeed. You know, people who don't do business don't understand this. They all think, oh, well, what's your business plan? Now execute against the business plan. A person like that, you're like, you know, that's great. You're probably wonderful at doing operations. I'd like to hire you to execute against my strategic plan. That's absolutely wonderful. But you're an executor. The general at the head of the business, he, he doesn't have that luxury of being able to, you know, I'll give, well, I'll make up a plan. The plan is irrefutable. I will execute against the plan. There's a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of business owners who would just love to be able to do that. That'd be called having a job. <laughs> and every, you know, but the, the fact is we, we're not allowed to have jobs when we're in charge. We have to be the leader going forward in the darkness, holding a torch. Everyone behind us can see the torch, but the leader can't see his own torch. He's seeing by the torch and it's an uncomfortable situation. And when you're trying to do this for God, it's even more uncomfortable, right? Because you say to yourself, jeepers, creepers, I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best here, but I have no guarantee that this is what God wants me to do. I might look for signs. I might look for confirmations, but I can doubt the signs and I can ignore the confirmations. You know, in the end, I'm stuck alone following this thing called the inner fire. I have something inside of me that's pushing me. I'd like to say, my friend, that's probably the Holy Spirit of God. That's probably a gift that God's given to this entire world through you. It's just that that gift for the rest of the world is a cross for you. The cross is that of constant uncertainty. The cross is that of never knowing if you're really doing the right thing. The cross is that looking behind you, there's a wonderful wake of greatness and inspiration but in front of you, there's only strong waves that you have to ram against again and again and again. And everyone behind you is cheering you on, but nobody's in front of you except the Lord himself. And you walk in that light of faith and you say, God, I hope to please you. And if I do not please you, then let me remember that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I have that desire to please you. And I have this virginal intention called the Virgin Mary inside of me, the spirit of Mary that desires to please you, desires to do everything that I possibly can for you and for your honor and your glory. 
but my God, please confirm what I'm doing by blessing it. Do you know Mother Teresa of Calcutta, that incredible saint whom the whole world admired? I mean, queens would come to see her. She felt inside of her heart that what she was doing was, you know, um, was not accepted by God. She didn't have any consolation. All she felt was dryness and darkness constantly. And yet she pushed on. Now, what, how did she push on? She would look back and say, look at the fruits. She would look and say, look at how many tabernacles. She called each one of the houses that she founded a tabernacle because that's where the chapel was. She said, look at how many tabernacles, 80 tabernacles. And there's videos of her doing this, you know, looking around. And that was her, her consolation was that Somehow or other, there were people getting excited about it as well. But inside of her, she had this crucifying factor of just being utterly alone. And everyone, no one could believe it. You know, when she wrote, her, when her letters and, and diaries, so to speak, or, were finally published, people realized that this incredible saint that was changing the world actually herself was in a constant crucible of inner suffering and turmoil. They couldn't believe it. People don't want to believe this aspect, but I'm not speaking to everybody. I'm speaking to you who are leaders. And every one of you who are leaders, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's talking about the fact that as a leader, we have this incredible cross. And the, the, the cross is that we do not know where we are going <laughs> by any kind of confirmation except our instincts, except our desire, accept the inner fire, and accept our faith. And there we have to walk alone. And we walk that path for the sake of all those who are called to follow, to fill in, to execute behind us. And when we do that, we can feel so lonely. We can feel so uncertain. And that uncertainty could ache because the more successful that we are in our leadership, the greater our responsibility. Now I've got people's families depending upon me. I've got people's jobs depending upon me. I've got people's inspiration depending upon me. I've started a motion. I've started a movement. And, and it's like kind of like Peter walking on water, right? It's amazing. Jesus lets him walk on water, and then he sees the wind and the waves. But it's after he's been initially successful that he sees the wind and the waves. He's, I mean, his first thing is, then Peter got out of the boat, and he walked on the water. It's a great sentence in Scripture. You know, all kinds of people are like, oh, Peter, he's no good. You know, he's just a bumbling idiot. He walked on water. How about you, right? Like, you know, I mean, like you start your business. Now you bring up that million dollar mark. Then you get to that $10 million mark. Then you get to that $20 million mark. And you're looking back and you're saying, my goodness, now I have, you know, 100 employees. What am I going to do? What if this was wrong? How do I make the next step? And the waves keep getting bigger and bigger. It only gets harder. It only gets harder, right? And whoo. It's at those moments that you need to remember that the God who called you into this is calling you to continue through it. And he's never going to leave you alone. Father Nathan has founded the St. John Institute, the MBA program that develops students into the leaders of tomorrow by giving them a missionary's heart and an entrepreneur's mind. Visit our website at stjohninstitute.org dare great things for Christ. That's why, I, you know, I, I loved looking at the life of St. Peter in Acts because there's just so much there that is consoling to us who are leaders. Peter, again, does not have anyone in front of him. There's never been a pope before him. There's no handbook for being a pope. There's no traditions. There's no staff. There's just him and the Lord. And so what does he do? Well, he makes stuff up. That's what he does. He invents, he innovates, he shifts, he moves. I mean, take a look at Acts 3 here. Here you got Peter in Acts 3. Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, 
But what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate in the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's, astounded. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Now look at what's happening. You've got two inventions right here. Two initiatives. Okay, there's no rule book. Peter's walking into the temple like he normally does. It's at the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon. They're going up to pray. He and John, they're probably talking about the Lord. They're probably talking about all the baptisms that they had to perform. You know, 3,000 people being converted. They had, you know, I don't know what they're talking about. Maybe they were just talking about the, you know, the, the weather. I don't know. All of a sudden, Peter, the leader, sees this man and he knows the inner fire, the Holy Spirit moving in him, what he has to do. The man has never walked. He's been crippled since birth. Imagine what his muscle tone must look like on his legs. There probably was none. He was a cripple who was never walked. And Peter has the audacity to say, rise up and walk. And the man does. What moved Peter to do that? I don't know. But this chapter, this motion inside of Peter is going to cause him to be in a very flexible very quick because immediately what happens in verse 11 all the people ran together to them in the portico now he's got a crowd a crowd of what a crowd of jews a crowd of the of jews who are not yet christians and the jews who are not yet christians are surrounding saint peter there and what does peter do he improvises a speech not only does he improvise right there by getting the guy, boom, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise him. He's never walked. I'm going to tell him to get up and walk. And the man does, leaping and bind, bounding around. Then he's clinging to Peter. And so what, is the, what does Peter do? Well, he speaks to them. Boom. Peter then, he opened his, Peter saw it. He addressed the people. Another flexibility. Flexibility to do the miracle. Flexibility then to address the people. Gives them this beautiful speech, you know, and he ends up saying, um, and you, your offspring, shall all your families of the earth be blessed. Verse 26, God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Right? How beautiful. Peter just turns, addresses the crowd, gives them this repentant speech. And it says, and as they were speaking to the people, this is chapter 4, verse 1. The priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed. <laughs> I love that. That word in Greek, great, great, greatly annoyed, it means literally like uh, torn in two, greatly distressed. It means being pulled apart inside because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed and the number of men came to be about 5,000. So Peter, at that, that moment, he improvises. And in that speech, in the Holy Ghost being, he, he risks something huge here. Now the Pope is in prison for the first time. He doesn't have a change of clothes. He doesn't have a toothbrush. He is not able to go and say goodbye to all of his friends. You know, what, what if he had a project waiting at the office? Too bad now, you know, Pope, you're now in jail, right? Like, so, I mean, look at what happens to Peter there. And yet, there he is. Why? Because he took that opportunity. He led, was he, did he make a mistake? You could almost imagine, like, right, some of the other apostles being like, Peter, you're not supposed to be in prison. How are you going to govern for prison? They would be sitting on the fence. They'd be telling him all kinds of discouraging things. Instead, Peter's there in jail. Now, he's in jail in the same house as the man who condemned Christ to death, handing him over to Pilate because they could not put a man to death themselves. Now, he's in that same jail. He's in some sort of pit, right? He's at the high priest's prison. 
And there he is going to face the same man who just about two months ago had put Jesus Christ into the hands of Pilate to be put to death. And now Peter's in the same prison. What's he thinking? Did he make a mistake? I converted 2,000 men in one day. That was huge. But at the same time, like the innovation, so what happens? He pulls him out and Peter speaks and addresses the high priest and tries to convert him as well. Flexibility. He uses the circumstances that are in front of him and like water, he bends, he moves. He has a mission in front of him that's more important than the risk behind him. He measures his risk versus the value. And the value is the fidelity that he has to Christ, the Lord who called him. And we as leaders have got, I mean, like, there is no way you can remove risk. There is no way you're going to ever run away and be able to say, oh, yeah, this is great. I made a plan and I executed against the plan and everything just went perfectly. Again, if you have a job, that is your job. It's a wonderful job. That, 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 that's a manager trying to hit his quarterly goals. I'm I, and here and that's a fine thing. I'm here talking about though the element of life where you do not have a manager able to hit quarterly goals where you're not able to you have to make the goals. And that takes a whole different skill set. That takes someone who's able to look forward and see what's happening and pivot and move because it's driven on the inside and there will always be an uncertainty, there will always be darkness, there will always be a doubt. But there's something greater than that. And that's the love that you have for the Lord who has put you into that position. And the love that you have for the people that are relying upon you to nail that position. And so you have to swallow your fear and stop looking at the wind and the waves. Trust in the Lord and move forward. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at info at stjohninstitute.org. That's info at stjohninstitute.org. And don't forget to subscribe to premium video content to form, unite, and inspire you at Eagle Eye Pro on our website, eagleeyeministries.org. That's eagleeyeministries.org.